Hello guys. In this lecture video, I will give an introduction to vectors and introduce you to some operations on vectors. This will be a two-part lecture. The first video will give you the basics of vectors, especially vectors in the three-dimensional space. And in the second video, we will do some operations on vectors. In particular, we will do addition and subtraction of vectors as well as scalar multiplication. So let's begin with the definition of a vector. What is a vector? So a vector is just any quantity with both magnitude and direction. Some examples will include displacement, velocity, or force. Now if you're hearing these terms for the first time, don't worry. You will encounter them in future lectures. Or more formally, we define a vector in the three-dimensional space as an ordered triple of real numbers a, B, C, written this way. These numbers A, B, and C are called the components of the vector. Now we can visualize vectors in the three-dimensional space by using a directed line segment. For example, if we have a vector which we will name V with an arrow above it with components A, B, and C, this will be represented by a directed line segment starting at a point, say, x0, y0, z0, to a terminal point, x0 plus a, y0 plus b, z0 plus c. So this vector, v, has initial point at this point and terminal point at this point. So this shows us the length of the vector v as well as its direction. Now, it will be easier if the initial point of the vector is the origin. Because in this case, x0 will be 0, y0 is 0, and z0 is 0. Therefore, the terminal point will be a, b, c. So in that case, we have a, another vector starting from the origin and having terminal point a, b, c. Now take note that this blue vector is also named v. Why? Because clearly, this blue vector has the same length as this red vector and it also points in the same direction. So any vector from an initial point P with coordinates x1, y1, z1 to a point Q with coordinates x2, y2, z2 will be denoted by PQ with an arrow above it. And this resulting vector PQ will have components x2 minus x1 y2 minus y1, z2 minus z1. Or in other words, the difference between the coordinates of the terminal point Q and the initial point P. Now, like what we did earlier, a vector V with components A, B, C that starts at the origin will have a terminal point at the point A, B, C. This vector is what we call the position representation of the vector v. Now, two vectors v1 with components a1, b1, c1, and v2 with components a2, b2, c2 are equal if and only if they have the same length and they point in the same direction. Or in other words, their components are equal. We denote the zero vector as zero with an arrow above it. The zero vector is the vector with all the components equal to zero. If one component of a vector is zero, then the position representation of that vector lies in the coordinate plane. For example, if we have the vector v with components a, b, zero, since the z component or the third component is zero, this vector will lie on the x, y plane. Hence, we may simply write the vector v as a, b. You have to take note that this shortened form or version of writing the components of a vector v will only hold if the third component is zero. In other words, if the second component is zero, you cannot drop the second component. So let's look at some examples. So consider the vector from the point 4, 1, negative 3 to the origin. Take note that the initial point is 4, 1, negative 3 and the terminal point is the origin. So this is not a vector in the position representation because a vector in the position representation should start at the origin and not 
end of the origin. Okay, so what are the components of the vector V? As we've seen in the previous slide, to determine the components of a vector given its initial and terminal point, we just subtract the coordinates of the terminal point minus the initial point. So in this case, the first component of the origin is 0 minus the first coordinate of the initial point is 4. So 0 minus 4 will be the first component of the vector v. The second component will be 0 minus 1. And the third component is 0 minus negative 3, which gives us the vector with components negative 4, negative 1, 3. Let's look at another example. So what are the components of the vector starting from the point 2, negative 5, 1 to the point 0, 2, negative 4? So remember, terminal point minus the initial point. So we have the first component is 0 minus negative minus 2, 2 minus negative 5 for the second component, and the third component is negative 4 minus 1, which gives us the vector negative 2, 7, negative 5. So here's another example. So the components of the vector starting from the point 2, negative 5, 1 to the point negative 2, negative 6, 4 will be so negative 2 minus 2, negative 6 minus negative 5, 4 minus 1, which gives us negative 4 negative 1, 3. Now the components of these vectors, this vector is the same as the vector components of the vector in our first example. So we say that this vector is equal to this vector, even though they do not start and end at the same point. As we said earlier, a vector has a magnitude and direction. First, let us talk about the magnitude of a vector. So the magnitude, or sometimes called norm, of a vector with components a, b, and c will be denoted by this and is defined as the length of any representation of the vector v. And it will be given by the formula square root of a squared plus b squared plus c squared, or in other words, the square root of the sum of the squares of the components. Take note that for any vector v in the three dimensional space, the norm of this vector v is always greater than or equal to zero. In other words, the norm of a vector cannot be negative. In particular, the norm of a vector v is equal to zero if and only if it is the zero vector. In other words, the zero vector is the only vector with norm equal to zero. So now let's look at some examples. So given these vectors, let us find their magnitude. First, let us consider the vector v1 with components negative 4, 3, 12. From the formula given earlier, the norm of v1 will be the square root of the sum of the squares of its components. So therefore, we have square root of negative 4 squared plus 3 squared plus 12 squared or the square root of 16 plus 9 plus 144, which is equal to the square root of 169 or 30. Therefore, this vector v1 has length 30. Now let's look at another vector v2 with components negative square root of 10 over 10, square root of 10 over 5, square root of 2 over 2. Again, the magnitude or the norm of this vector v2 will be the square root of the sum of the squares of the components. So in this case, this is the square root of 1 over 10 plus 2 fifths plus 1 half, which gives us 1. Now a vector whose magnitude is 1 is a very special vector, which we will call a unit vector. Now let's talk about the direction of a vector. So consider the position representation of a vector. We will let alpha be the least non-negative angle that this vector in position representation makes with the positive x-axis. Likewise, we will define beta to be the least non-negative angle 
that this vector makes with the positive y-axis and gamma to be the angle measured from the positive z-axis. If we take the cosines of each of these angles, then we get what we call the direction cosines of the vector d. Take note that since we're taking the least non-negative angles, each of these direction angles, alpha, beta, and gamma, has value on the interval 0 to pi. Now, if V has coordinates A, B, C, then cosine of alpha is just A over the magnitude of V, cosine of beta is just B over the magnitude of V, and cosine of gamma is C over the magnitude of the vector V. This can be easily seen by simple trigonometry. Now, it will follow that cosine squared alpha plus cosine squared beta plus cosine squared gamma is equal to 1. This formula shows us the relationship between the direction cosines of a, any vector v. Now, let's take another example. Given a vector v with component square root of 2, negative 1, 1, what are its direction angles? Remember that in the formula, we need the magnitude of the vector. So first we compute the magnitude of v. Again, from the formula for the magnitude, it is given by the square root of the sum of the squares of the components. So we have negative 2 squared. Square root of 2 squared is 2. Negative 1 squared is 1. And 1 squared is 1. So hence, the magnitude is equal to 2. Therefore, Cosine alpha is the first coordinate divided by the magnitude. So cosine alpha is square root of 2 over 2. Cosine beta is negative 1 over 2. And cosine gamma is 1 over 2. Since alpha, beta, and gamma are in the interval 0 to pi, then we will find an angle alpha whose cosine is square root of 2 over 2 in this interval. That is, alpha is pi over 4. Likewise, since cosine beta is negative 1 half, the angle in the interval 0 to pi whose cosine beta is negative 1 half is 2 pi over 3. Similarly, since cosine alpha is 1 half, taking the angle from 0 to pi whose cosine is 1 half, we get gamma is pi over 3. Now, let us show that there is no vector with direction angles alpha equal to 5 pi over 6, beta equals pi over 3, and gamma equals pi over 4. Now, suppose there is a vector with these given direction angles. Then, cosine of alpha is equal to cosine of 5 pi over 6, which gives us negative square root of 3 over 2. Cosine beta is cosine pi over 3, which is 1 half. And cosine gamma is cosine pi over 4, which is 1 over square root of 2. Now, if these are the direction cosines of a vector v, then it must follow the relationship between these direction cosines, as given by the formula cosine squared alpha plus cosine squared beta plus cosine squared gamma should be equal to 1. Now, taking the squares of these direction cosines and taking their sum, we have Square, negative square root of 3 over 2 is 3 fourths, plus 1 half squared is 1 fourth, plus 1 over square root of 2 squared is 1 half. This equals 3 halves. Now this is a contradiction since, as we have seen earlier, the sum of the squares of the direction cosines, cosines should be equal to 1. Therefore, these alpha, beta, and gamma cannot be direction angles for a vector. Hence, no such vector with given direction angles exist. This shows us that the direction cosines are dependent on each other. That is, if you know two direction cosines, then you can always compute the third one. For example, if you know the angles alpha and beta, then you can compute cosine of alpha and cosine of beta.
and using the identity cosine squared alpha plus cosine squared beta plus cosine squared gamma equals 1. You can always compute for the third angle. Now this ends the first part of the lecture. Thank you very much for listening and I hope you check out the second video for the continuation of our discussion.